component of the program, mindfulness. And uh, what we do is we ask those participants that are in our group to support one another on their journey towards changing their lifestyle. And uh, that helps to cultivate peace and wellness. And that's a nice way of living, right? Um, and then I also help to create programs like this one that you're attending tonight. So thank you all again for joining. We have a special program in store for you. Um, we are joined by a special guest, Chef Katie Simmons, and I'm going to let her or ask her to introduce herself now. What's up? Thanks, Lori. Thanks for the intro. Again, I wish I was there in person and Tonight, you're just gonna have to go with me and smell the smells and hear the sounds and we'll all be there together in spirit. Um, my name is Katie Simmons. I am a personal chef. I'm based in Chicago, right by Wrigley Field. And I specialize in creating healthy, delicious dinners for busy families. Um, I've also been doing virtual cooking classes <laughs> in these quarantine times. Um, and I really focus on giving you really nutritious food that's also delicious. So combining the best of both worlds. Um, and I'm so excited to be here tonight. So thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Chef. Okay, so here's how tonight's gonna go. Chef Katie and I are gonna play a little game of tag. All right, so I have a PowerPoint that I'm gonna present. And then throughout the PowerPoint, what I'm gonna do is push pause and I'm gonna tag Katie and she's it. And she's gonna demonstrate three recipes tonight. So get ready. I hope you're prepared for uh, some deliciousness coming out of her kitchen. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a PowerPoint and what I'm gonna do is just share my screen. So bear with me. Okay, so without further ado, this is how to nourish your immune system with plant-based choices. So my objectives for this evening are for you to be able to define or describe what the characteristics are of a plant-based diet. I want you to be able to talk to your family and your friends and speak the way that I understand plant-based diets to be. The next objective is for you to discover the specific immune benefits of plant-based diet. Right? This is a really timely topic for all of us. And then lastly, thanks to our special guests, I'd like for you to be able to identify specific ways that you can actually apply this great information and the knowledge that you acquire. How can you start to cook more for yourself at home and incorporate more plant-based meals? So what's all the fuss about plant-based diets? Right, They seem to be very popular and it's for good reason. Well, we have over two decades worth of research that supports that plant-based diets help to reduce the risk for cancer. And if that's not enough to convince you, there's also compelling data that plant-based diets also minimize the risk for other chronic diseases, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Now I'm just highlighting the physical benefits of plant-based diets but there's lots of other great reasons to consider pursuing a plant-based diet. One of them might be environmental sustainability because at this current pace of our food system, um, it's, it's basically being described as dysfunctional and it's not gonna be able to support our generations to come with healthy foods. So, you know, there's, there's more than one reason why you might wanna pursue a plant-based diet. So what are plant-based diets? Great question. I think the most straightforward and simple answer to that is when you think about planning your meals, think about incorporating any one or more of the following. Whole grains, beans and lentils, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and fruit. Okay, if your bowl, if your plate incorporates those foods most of the time, that's plant-based eating. So I really like this graphic. This is essentially depicting for us in a day's time the amount of servings that one would want to try to consume in this plant-based lifestyle in order to achieve nutrition recommendations and good health. Now, again, this is sort of general information, right? So if you're looking for specific advice, consult your friendly oncology dietitian. So you might be wondering like plant-based meals, like are they exotic? Are they something that I'm so not familiar with? What do I do? 
I want to give you some confidence that chances are you already are familiar or are eating plant-based meals. So here's a few examples. First, there's the good old avocado toast. Super yummy, trendy, delicious, right? And it's a plant-based choice. A lentil and vegetable soup, maybe for lunch, plant-based. I love mixed nuts for a snack, plant-based. And then even for dinner, something like a stir fry. And when you replace animal protein with a plant protein like tofu, now that's plant-based. Now, just as it's important to understand what plant-based choices are, I also want to distinguish what they are not. Okay, so technically some of our ultra processed foods are defined as being plant-based, right? So think about refined carbohydrates, especially crackers and chips, refined grains, technically plant-based, right? However, they are inferior in terms of the nutritional quality to our other plant-based choices. We know what happens when we process carbohydrates, especially we strip it down. There's literally not much nutrition left, right? And along the way, we accumulate all the unwanted extras, things like sugars and salts and added fats, saturated fats. That renders the final product that much less nutritious for us. What also comes to mind about plant-based choices that I want you to understand don't technically qualify as a plant-based choice nutritionally speaking, are our sugary foods as well as our alternatives. So products like dairy alternatives are a great example. Some of the products on the market have so many added sugars to them, it's like you'd be eating dessert. <laughs> okay, so think about that. Just because something's an alternative and it's a plant-based choice does not necessarily, it equates nutritionally with other options. Okay, and that's what I'm going to help point out tonight. So did you know that plant-based diets come in many different shapes and forms? So there's more than one way to eat a plant-based diet. And I just want to highlight some of the popular ones that you might be familiar with. The first is the Mediterranean diet. So in the Mediterranean diet, they do eat small amounts of fish. Rarely, but they do consume fish. Most of the foods that they eat in, they eat are coming from plant choices. So your beans and your lentils, your whole grains, lots of vegetables, and they do have fruit, maybe for dessert. The Asian diets, plant-based as well, right? So they eat tons of veggies, especially those funky sea vegetables that are super nutritious, good for the gut. Um, and then they consume a good amount of whole soy foods like tofu. They like to start their meals with a hot soup, like a dashi. And they incorporate mindful eating, which is another nice component, I think, another kind of bonus to that plant-based way of eating. And then lastly, I wanted to point out the DASH diet. So if you haven't heard of the DASH diet, that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And it has been clinically shown to help reduce blood pressure. And that's because of the components of the diet. They're mostly plants. So it's very high in vegetables, high in fruit, whole grains, again, those nuts and seeds. They do incorporate small amounts of dairy in the DASH diet. Um, and that's because it lends some important calcium, which is necessary for helping control blood sugar. Don't need dairy for that calcium, and that's what a dietitian can help you identify. Now, if you hear anything from me tonight, just pause whatever you're doing, this is the slide I want you to pay the most attention to, okay? Because I want to help you eat better, but I don't want you to eat just any old plant-based diet, okay? So we're going to distinguish the difference, and we're going to, when you're speaking to friends and family, this is how you're going to really impress them. So not just any old plant-based diet. We're going to put two words in front of that plant-based diet, and those two words start with W and F. What am I talking about? Whole food, plant-based diet, okay? There's a distinction, right? So when I pointed out some of those ultra processed foods, it loses the nutrition and it gains all those extra, all those empty calories. So what are some examples of whole food plant-based choices? The first one that comes to my mind is the good old Sumo Orange. Has, has anyone, please tell me you've had this. If you haven't, get out to the grocery store like tonight. Yeah. <laughs> we wrap. 
delicious, right? It's a special orange. It's only available to us at this time of year. But what I want to point out as well is that notice it's wrapped in its own natural packaging, right? There's no plastics, there's no cardboards. That's a good indication that it's a whole food choice. Another thing that comes to my mind are some of the fake meat products that are on the market. Um, and not, not necessarily bad, but I think you could do better. And I think you could take advantage of plant proteins from lentils or from beans or a combination of them with some whole grains, maybe throw some veggies in there and you have a better version of a meat alternative. And it's not that difficult to do. I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up farro. It's one of my favorite ancient whole grains. It comes to my mind too, because it's a nice option for, for a replacement. So I think of it as more hearty, dense white rice or uh, orzo, a nice substitution in those types of recipes, but, and it only takes 20 minutes to cook, but it's an ancient grain. So this was fed to Roman soldiers. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. And then lastly, as we're starting to cook more and take some processing out of our diet, we want to take advantage of other plants like herbs and spices that can lend some flavor with, again, without adding sugar and salt and extra fats. So what are the benefits of plant-based diets? There's a lot of fiber in them. And those of you that know me, I could probably dedicate an entire lecture to just fiber alone, but we're going to save that for another time. <laughs> plant-based diets are known to reduce inflammation. They're associated with managing a healthy weight and they also support our immune system, hence why we're here tonight. So what is it specifically about our immune system that whole food plant-based diets seem to support? Well, I'm not an immunolo immunologist, so it's not really my scope to try to explain how complicated our immune system works and how intricately involved our complex food and in a diet is involved with immune function. So I thought it would be easy to point out what I have known to be four ways that whole food plant-based diets can help support our immune function. So those four things are that they provide essential immune nutrients. They have a ton of antioxidants. They're anti-inflammatory, like I just mentioned. And last but not least, they support our gut microbiota. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to dive deeper into each of those four ways that whole food plant-based diets can support our immune function. But before I do that, I'm going to say tag to Katie. She's yeah. it. She's it. <laughs> so I'm going to stop my share. Okay, now, now you're going to see Katie uh, demonstrate her first recipe. Awesome. I don't know about you guys, but hearing all that information makes me hungry. So let's get cooking. Um, the first thing we're going to make tonight are green chili potato tacos. And like Lori was saying, a lot of the foods, people, we like think plant-based. I don't know what that is. What am I supposed to eat? I don't know what to eat. And my number one answer to that is potatoes. Like I'm Irish by trade. So my family, we grew up eating potatoes. Sweet potatoes are affordable. They make a great dinner. Um, and the coolest part about potatoes, well, there's two cool things is that they're really affordable, which is great. That's what got me through college. Um, and they're really easy to cook. So we are actually going to microwave our potatoes for our potato tacos. So these are just um, Yukon Gold potatoes. I've cleaned them, scrubbed them off. I'm gonna put them in a microwave safe baking dish and put them in my microwave. And my microwave has a potato setting. So it just like makes life easy. Um, your microwave probably does too. You didn't even realize it, but you probably have a potato setting on your microwave. So I'm gonna hit it for three potatoes because that's about the same as like six of those little guys and let that go. Now, while that's going, we're gonna, we're gonna spice up those potatoes. So they got a little like fiesta thing happening. So I'm gonna get my pan warming up. To spice them up, we're going to need a diced onion. This is just a little, little yellow onion or white onion, whatever kind of onion you have on hand. And the best part about this meal is that it comes together so quickly. 
Um, so this becomes one of my favorite dinners. It's also, if you love like a savory brunch, or you like tacos for brunch or breakfast, this is like the best breakfast taco recipe you could ever make because <laughs> it comes together so fast. All right. And stay tuned because I'm going to talk about the potato. You want a taco? Taco? I'm going to taco about a potato. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. How many puns can we come up with tonight? <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> okay. So just give our onion a little dice. And if you, I'm going to angle myself down so you guys can see my cuts a little bit better. But if you've never learned how to dice an onion, the best way you cut it in half, and you're going to have the belly button end. I don't know if you can see that. But that's the end where the, the stem is, where it hooks into the ground. Point that to your left. And we're going to make some planks. A couple little, just a couple little planks. Rotate it. And then you make a couple, a couple up and downs. <laughs> and then from there, rotate it back, do some more up and downs, and you got a nice little dice going on. Now, I'm a chef and I like cut things my whole, that's all I do all day basically is dice things. Um, and I, but I know that some of us are like, you know what, I do not want to even mess with a knife at night. Well, it's brilliant because they sell diced onion now in the store. So you don't even have to like dice it. If you're, if you're like short on time and don't want to pull out the knife or the cutting board, you can get the free diced onion. It's amazing. That's right on my alley. <laughs> hey chef, we had a question. Yeah. If your microwave doesn't have that potato, that precious potato button. Yes. What would you, what would you suggest for about the time and power level? Yeah, so I would suggest do 90, 60 to 90 second incre increments, depending on how powerful your microwave is. And after that 60 to 90 seconds, just give them a little rotation or check them with a knife to see how they're cooking. Um, and it'll probably take you about five to six rounds of that um, to get them done. But yeah, you can just do it on, that's all the potato setting does. It like cooks it and then it like chills out. And then it cooks it and it chills out. So you just have to like do the manual way of that. Um, you can also roast them in the oven, it, especially if you like to do meal prep on the weekend and you just roast off a bunch of potatoes. That's a great little thing to do. Um, and then you can use them all week for different recipes. So we've got our onion in the pan. I got a, got a medium heat here. I didn't add any oil to the pan. You really don't need it. I tend to cook with little to no oil these days, again, as a way to like Watch how many calories I'm putting in my body. <laughs> oh my God. If, you do, if, if that's all you do, you've won for the night, just to smell like sauteed onion. So I'm gonna put a little bit of cumin in there. About a teaspoon. And get that sauteing and you'll, you want the cumin to be activated, to become aromatic. It smells so good. A little, a little fun cumin fact. So the number one spice that's used most throughout the world is black pepper. But can I you, did not know that. <laughs> yeah, it's also the, one of the most expensive spices, which is crazy. Black pepper is very expensive um, and re relative to other spices. But what is the number two most common use spice throughout the world? Does anyone else want to guess? <laughs> I feel like I should know cumin. This. Cumin. It's cumin. Yeah, it's cumin because cumin is in a lot of Indian food. It's in a lot of Mexican food. It's in a lot of African food, and that is like most of the world's population. And the way I describe cumin, it's very earthy. It kind of like hits you in the back of the throat, um, and it smells like you're going into like your Mexican hacienda in the middle of the day. That's what cumin smells like. So we're gonna let that go. And once I start smelling that, I'm gonna turn the heat way down. Um, Cause that's kind of just gonna hang out while I wait for the potatoes to cook. Now we gotta make a little slaw topping that's gonna go on our tacos. Cause we wanna make, make it, you know, have some interesting flavors, give it some crunch. So our slaw, you can use, I'm gonna use, take a hint from the store. I got this coleslaw mix. Um, 
sometimes you can find like shredded red cabbage, but when there's a snowstorm and there's a rush of the produce stand at Whole Foods, you get what you can get. Like, <laughs> I don't know if anybody was shopping yesterday, but it was like the apocalypse. <laughs> so that's essentially like a mix of different cabbage. Yeah, so yeah. this is a mix. It's a mix of red and green. And then there's usually some carrots in there too. So it's basically like a coleslaw mix, same idea. Um, and remember the more colors you eat, the more nutrition you're getting. So um, getting all those colors is just really gonna help you. All right, so we're gonna get the cabbage. We gotta add a little bit of like a tang, a, a pop to it. So that's gonna come from some red wine vinegar. Just kind of eyeballing this. Any slaw is gonna have a little bit of vinegar to give it some pop. Hmm. And then I like to massage that a little bit to break it down and that'll help soften the cabbage so that it's not quite like super raw. You don't wanna feel like a rabbit. You know, even though you're eating all this healthy plant-based foods, you don't wanna ever feel like you're still chewing like 20 minutes later. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Just a reminder too, for the audience, we will be sharing the power, my PowerPoint as well as all of these recipes. Okay. So to give it some Mexican fiesta flair, I got some fresh cilantro. Oh man. And we're gonna just give it a quick chop, add that in there. Chef Katie, what if you are one of those unfortunate individuals that does not, it's not me. But let's say <laughs> you don't care for cilantro because of a genetic predisposition. <laughs> yes. So I like to add some sort of fresh herb. So fresh chopped parsley would be nice. Fresh chives are, have kind of been my jam lately. So if you got some chives, get those in there. If you like neither none of that, then you can just omit it. Um, or if you don't have it on hand, you can just leave it out. All right, so that's going in the pot. Now we got to add some sort of like creamy thing, right? Like, but we don't want to use something like mayonnaise because that's that, that's one of those things that comes in those highly processed jar things that looks like it might be plant-based, but is not a whole food. So what's our favorite creamy, delicious whole food? Avocados. Um, and you can check to make sure your avocado is ripe. Give it a little push and that push should hold. It should hold its indent. Just want to give it a slice. Mm. Avocados are something I always have on hand. And what's really great about them, you can always have a couple of them, get them ripe. Once they are ripe, throw them in your fridge and you can leave them in there for a couple of weeks and they'll be fine. What's even cooler is you can freeze avocado. Like I could freeze this right now, pull it out in a week, two weeks, a month. I went on a trip once and came back two weeks later and I opened my freezer and I was like, oh my God, my avocados are amazing and they, and they taste great. So just little fun things. <laughs> Gonna use a big old scooper, get this guy out. Oh man, it smells so good. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Gonna have to, <laughs> just gonna have to be jealous at times. Oh. That means we have to make it ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So avocados are awesome, and what's kind of cool, like yes, we all know they're good source of good source of healthy fats, but because they're a whole foods, they also have fiber, which kind of blew my mind the first time I realized that. I was like, oh wait, avocados have fiber? How's that possible? Um, but they do. There's also other cool nutrients in there. All right, a little bit of salt and pepper. And then I'm just gonna use my hands to mash this up. And I really wanna get the avocado, avocado, all pushed up with the slaw. This is one of those, like the messier, the better. I love cooking. Um, quarantine has been so hard on so many of us, right? But I think cooking is a great way to get in touch with your senses. And like you can feel your food, you can smell your food, you can hear your food. It's a good break from screen time if we're working at a computer all day. Yeah, make dinner. <laughs> That's your antidote. Okay, so this is this is pretty, it's pretty messy and, and gloopy. That's what we wanted to do. Um, 
if you are a heataholic and you love spicy food, this is when you can add a few notches of hot sauce or even some diced jalapeno in there, and you will be set for set for the sweats. I'm gonna say, <laughs> um, but it's really nice. All right, give my hands a rinse. I think I heard the microwave go, so that's a good sign. Let's see how our potatoes are doing. Be careful when you're taking it out. Now, Katie, look, can I ask if you made that slaw? Yeah. Like, could you store that in the fridge if you had leftovers? Absolutely, absolutely. So we all know avocados turn brown, right? And what makes them turn brown is what we call oxidation. And that just means they are exposed to oxygen. So to keep this looking good, I would put plastic wrap over it as tightly as possible and squeeze out as much oxygen as possible. And then the next day it'll still be good and you can give it a little toss. If there is brown, you can just scrape it off, but it's still gonna taste amazing. Um, it actually kind of tastes better after it sits for like 10, 15 minutes. So yeah, good question. All right, my potatoes are tender. I can slit a knife in there and it just slides right out. So that's a good sign. Hot potato, hot potato. <laughs> All right, coming out. Get that guy out of the way. And I, um, I just want to cut these into bite-sized pieces. I kind of like them on the bigger side because it feels more satisfying. So third reason to love potatoes is they're like super satisfying. I mean, who doesn't love biting, going into a big bowl of mashed potatoes? It's like the most satisfying ever. Um, same thing with like potato tacos. And sometimes when we're eating more plant-based, um, we can make the mistake of eating too many salads or not eating enough like grains and beans and starchy carbs to really feel satisfied. So it's important to incorporate things like potatoes um, or farro. It's one of my favorites too, Lori. Farro and quinoa. I love quinoa. It cooks in like 10 minutes. Like really? Yeah. But like you can't beat it. You can't beat it. Yeah. Like, and I love that point, you know, like plant-based, like we, we don't want to forget about all of, it's not just salads, right? Yeah. Which can, can leave you really terribly unsatisfied and that's no way to live, right? So like, I, that's why I love starchy vegetables, those hearty whole grains. They, they really have like just this satisfying, especially comforting feeling like this time of year is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. You need it. You need it when it's, when it's what feels like negative 20 outside and you're like, what, how am I gonna get through today? You need some starchy carbs. <laughs> All right, so those are gonna go in the pot. I'm also adding these diced green chilies. So again, I'm taking a little trick from the store um, and I got the hot spicy ones because I like it. They usually come in two options. You can usually get mild or you can usually get hot. So pay attention to what you like and also be mindful if you're cooking for kids or anybody who might be sensitive to spice. You can, you can never take out spice. You can only add it later. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is awesome. All right. That's essentially done. Just a little bit of salt and pepper. And then let's heat up some tortillas. Tortillas. <laughs> A couple way to heat up tortillas. My favorite way is just to do it right on the burner. <laughs> I do it. I do it the Mexican way. When you go down to like Mexico and they're heating up things right on the kamal, it smells so good. Like, okay, I should do that too. Love it. Give it a quick little. <laughs> if you're doing a bunch of these at once, I would just take this whole thing wrap it in foil and throw it in your oven, like a 350 oven for about 10 minutes. And we just want it to be pliable. That's pliable. Don't burn your, I have chef hands. Don't burn your hands <laughs> if it's too hot. All right, get you off. We'll get a little bit of this. Get my plate out so you guys can see. I can, I wish I was there. <laughs> a little bit of our um, slaw. Yeah, beautiful, coming out. Yeah, 
me a, give me a little bit more color there so maybe it really make a pop. And that's it. You guys have tackles for dinner. I wish my lighting was, here we go. <laughs> but you see how substantial that is and um, how quick and easy that was. Love it. You can feed your family on that. All right. I mean, how long did that take? Did anyone time, Katie? Probably like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. A little, a little bit more, but that's impressive. All right, Lori, I'm going to tag it back to you so I can wash my hands. All right, tags. <laughs> All right, everyone, I promised I would share my PowerPoint now, and we're going to pick up where I left off. So I wanted to dig deeper into how whole food plant-based diets help support our immune system. So let's start with the first way. It provides us with a wealth of um, essential immune nutrients. So what am I talking about when I say that? Well, there are some nutrients in our diet that are essential. And when we use that word essential, it means they're vital. We have to eat them, okay? So a well-planned diet means that you will consume these essential nutrients regularly. So generally they are our vitamins and minerals. Our vitamins and minerals are necessary to help support how well our immune function operates. So we're gonna break them down into the vitamins first and vitamins A, C, D, E, B6, and folate. They're all very important for our immune system function for different reasons. And things like sweet potatoes, even the other white potatoes, very high in several of these vitamins. Same goes for bell peppers, especially red bell peppers, very high in some of these vitamins. The next group are minerals. So zinc, selenium, iron, and copper, all very important to allow our immune system to function the way it's meant to function. So things like dark leafy greens or baby spinach, it's high in several different minerals. And cashews I put on there because that's a nice plant-based choice if you're looking to get more zinc in your diet. And then we also have essential fatty acids. So the, I think, epitome of a plant-based choice that provides these essential fatty acids are chia seeds. And maybe if we have time at the end, we can talk about how to use chia seeds. So how do these essential nutrients work? Well, vitamin C, I consider to be like a builder, right? So it's, it's important to maintain the health and the integrity of our skin. And that serves as a very important barrier to keep pathogens out. Vitamin E, protects our immune cells. So without it, our immune cells are exposed and potentially at risk for damage from any pathogens. Then we have vitamin A. And vitamin A is sort of similar to vitamin C. It's like a reinforcer, it's a builder. So it helps to maintain the integrity of the tissues that are in our respiratory tract, very important. Vitamin D, I consider to be sort of like air traffic control. It's a regulator. So it's helping make sure and oversee all of the various functions of our immune system. And it's a very important component in terms of diet to support immune health. And then the last two are some minerals. So zinc is a builder. It manufactures healthy immune cells. And selenium is another mineral and it's also a builder. So it makes antioxidant enzymes. So with what Chef Katie just demonstrated, there's a particular ingredient that really hits almost all of these vitamins and minerals. Well, you see it there on my slide, <laughs> the humble potato. The humble potato is a plant-based powerhouse. And as Chef Katie demonstrated, it's so versatile, it's inexpensive, it's quick and easy. But now you have permission as it relates to your immune nutrition support. Potatoes really fit the bill and they're a great option for you. So I don't want you to be afraid of those potatoes. She also used avocado. So avocado is a great source of vitamin E. And she also used that cabbage. All types of cabbage, all colors of cabbage are high in both vitamin C and vitamin A. So great choices there. Well done, chef. <laughs> so guess what? It's your turn again, tag your it. So Jeff's gonna make now her second recipe, the Roman chickpea tuna salad, love it. 
Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had dinner. Now we're going to backtrack and go to lunch. Um, and this is, Lori talked earlier about like some of the plant-based um, fake out foods that we see on the market these days. They might be impossible or beyond belief or whatever fun names they have. Um, but it's important to remember that those are not necessarily the best choices. Yes, they're maybe better choices, but you can do better, as she said. So chickpeas are one of those secret secrets among the plant-based world that it's very versatile, kind of like the potato, and it can be like morphed into different shapes and textures, and it's amazing. Um, so we're going to make a tuna salad that has a lot of like Italian flavor, Mediterranean flavors, but we're going to start with our chickpeas. Wait a second, that says garbanzo beans. Is, is that the chickpeas, garbanzo beans? We know they're the same thing, right? Like, <laughs> so whatever your can says, this is what you want it to look like. You're going with, yeah. A little uh, factoid for you, Chef Katie. That was my childhood nickname. Garbanzo or chickpeas? I swear to you, a garbanzo bean. <laughs> Why? I was destined to be a dietitian. I don't know. That's so funny. That's awesome. <laughs> I kind of like chickpea for like a dog name. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we got our canned beans and I'm going to give them a drain and a rinse. And this is something whenever you're using canned beans, you want to wash off the canned flavor. Um, that's just my opinion as a chef. I've seen recipes before that say, don't rinse the beans. I don't know, that, that, that canned foamy stuff just doesn't appeal to me. So can't, we're gonna let those drain a little bit more. Um, to give our chickpea salad some texture, I've got celery here. I've just got three stalks of celery. I'm gonna cut off the very ends. The celery is actually one of my favorite flavoring ingredients because it has so much flavor especially in the leaves, you want to save those leaves. So don't throw them away. Put them in your salads, put them in your soups. So much flavor there. All right, give these a nice long sliver. And then we just want to dice these into bite-sized pieces. Or what is really helpful is if you think about the size of the chickpea, we're going to try to make everything about that size. Did they sell celery cut up also? Oh my gosh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great option also. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm gonna get you one of those food choppers next time. You just like put this, put the celery in and you push it down and it comes out like perfectly nice. Love oh it. <laughs> <laughs> I was teaching a cooking class once and this guy pulls out his food chopper and I was like, no, you need to how to dice an onion. He's like, no, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> like, okay, whatever. Oh my gosh. So celery is going to give us some texture. I also want to add some sun-dried tomatoes. Let me get the bag open. Um, and these also give us like a little bit of chewy texture. We need about a fourth of a cup. So I just kind of eyeball it and make a little pile. Notice I got sun-dried tomatoes that are actually dried and they're not stored in oil. Um, and these, the only ingredients here are tomatoes and a little bit of citric acid to help preserve them. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. The ones, the ones stored in oil can be pretty, well, oily, <laughs> honestly. And I don't want all that oil in here. I just want some nice light flavor. So just give these a rough chop. If you don't have or, or can't find those sun-dried tomatoes, roasted red peppers that come in a jar are also really nice. Um, I know we're living in a world of quarantine and pandemic and things at the grocery store are not always what you want them to be. <laughs> um, so it's okay to modify and adapt and, and take a moment and think, okay, well, could I use something else or could I just leave it out of the recipe? Would it still say the same? Give yourself some freedom and some liberty and don't be too hard on yourself in these, these crazy days. <laughs> I really appreciate that because I, yeah, I just, just, I like to wing it, you know, like I feel like, and that's what helps me build confidence in the kitchen. Nice. Yeah. Like for instance, I went shopping yesterday and there were no red bell peppers and this recipe calls for red bell pepper. And so I thought, okay, what has that what would give me the same idea of a red bell pepper? And I was like, I really like the red color. 
and also the fresh flavor. So they, they had tomatoes. So I'm going to get some diced tomato going in here. Love it. Yeah, so this sounds like a versatile recipe too. Like you can kind of mix and match ingredients. Exactly, exactly. Very versatile. It should be. I mean, this is like something that you want in your belly within 10 minutes, right? So <laughs> you're not to sweat it. It can be very overwhelming to live in this world where like we see something on Instagram and and it's taken by a professional food photographer and it took them three hours to, you know, get the right hue and lighting and setting and shadows and we see it in two seconds and it sets the standard of that's what dinner should look like oh my gosh well, chef katie you've never witnessed debbie Cronenberger and myself in the okay. kitchen when we put on programs <laughs> right. it needs a little help but you know we get through it and i think we create some nice things nice. <laughs> um we're going to add a little bit of that mediterranean flavor with some capers and i'm gonna capers Jarred capers have the capers, but there's also the brine, and both of them have a lot of flavor. So I'm first going to add a couple teaspoons of brine. One thing to be mindful of, of is there's usually a lot of salt in, in capers. So if you're trying to avoid or keep your salt level low, you can skip them or you can omit the brine or even rinse your capers. And that'll still give you the flavor, but not with um, quite as much salt. So just give them a rough chop. I don't think they sell pre-chopped papers. So you might have to chop just that little bit. <laughs> oh my God. And then we're gonna also add some Kalamata olives. Kalamata, Kalamata with a K. Um, you can get them already pitted. That's great. Um, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, the only olives I ever ate were like the, the black olives that come in a can and you like put on the end of your finger and you eat one at a time. Or they came on a pizza and I was like, this is great. There's little like round holes on my pizza. Um, that doesn't even compare to what a Kalamata olive is. So this actually tastes like something that grew in Greece and has some flavor and it's kind of like a brininess. Um, and also salt in there a little bit of umami. All right, so just give them a rough chop. If you're having a rough day at work, you can give it a rougher chop. <laughs> we all have those days. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, usually I put fresh basil in this recipe, but again, modifying, adapting, this is a little bit of fresh parsley. So give it a rinse. Um, and fresh herbs are just awesome. Like keep a couple on hand every week and just add them to recipes and start to get more familiar with what different herbs taste like and how you like to use them in experiment and have fun. And like I said, fresh chives are like kind of my jam right now. Um, fresh tarragon, like in the past, I used to think I hated tarragon and then I like actually ate it and I was like, this is really delightful. Um, <laughs> Yeah. All right. How do you use tarragon, Katie? I make a dressing, like a green goddess dressing with tofu and tarragon. And then um, there's like lemon and Dijon mustard in there and a little bit of garlic. And you just puree it up. Wow. And it's summer in a bowl. And yeah. it makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to make a dressing, quote unquote. Um, look at my. And tahini. It's going to be the base of our dressing instead of using like a heavy mayo or a lot of oil or um, any sort of like A's thing things that end in A's we're going to use tahini here's the pop question. What seed is ground up to make tahini sesame. <laughs> yeah yeah it's sesame seeds it's like eating like butter made from sesame seeds since I'm taking peanuts you take sesame seeds. Mm. And it's so good. It's very affordable. I'm going to add a couple tablespoons of that. And Lori was talking earlier about eating nuts and seeds. Um, I tend to use a lot of nuts and seed butters when I'm making dressings. So I'll use like peanut butter in an Asian salad or with the stir fry. I'll use tahini when I'm doing like hummus or making a salad like this. And that's kind of more of how I eat my nuts and seeds. So it's not always just like snacking on walnuts. 
All right, not done, not done. A little bit of lemon juice. Mm. Yeah, I love that tip. And I bet you those dressings like add such a, another level, a whole nother dimension of flavor and like satisfaction. And they're really versatile. Like tahini doesn't have a whole lot of flavor. It just kind of tastes like roastedness. Um, so you can add like chili powder and make like a spice tahini. You can add lemon juice and make like a really fresh and light kind of dressing sauce. Um, yeah, okay, so that is salad. Now we get, let's go back to our chickpeas. I gotta get another bowl here. I'm gonna get my glass. Oh my gosh, bear with me. <laughs> Isn't it what the, the bowl you always need is always on the bottom. Like, okay, buried underneath the bottom. Uh -huh. And my guess, chef, is that we probably could substitute another bean for the garbanzo bean if we wanted to. You could, I, I'm not gonna lie. I do love the garbanzo texture here. Okay. I think like other white beans, like cannellini gets too creamy and can get a little too mushy. Okay. Um, that said, most of your flavor is here. In, gotcha. Right? Yeah. Your, your garbanzo bean is just kind of like the vehicle. It's like the happy train to carry all the, <laughs> the food. So we're going to mash these up. I'm just using a fork. And I want to mash them up. Mash, mash, mash. So that it kind of looks like canned tuna um, without the smell. <laughs> oh man. My mom loves making tuna salad. I don't know if it's a Southern thing or if it's like her mom thing, but like every time I go home and I open the fridge, I can smell it before I even see anything. It's like, oh God. And then she'll be like, I made tuna salad. I'm like, mom, I don't eat tuna salad. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> whatever, she's fun. She's trying. She's trying, yeah. <laughs> but it's something I grew up on and it's so funny how like we have those food memories and they stay with us forever. <laughs> All right. I should ask her if her mom made a lot of tuna salad. I don't think she did though. That's just kind of funny. Um, so we want to mash this up. You can kind of see it's getting to that point where we're like, and it looks like tuna, like it's kind of shredded and kind of like mushy, but still has some texture, little, little bits and pieces. I, just, I, I was watching Jamie Oliver a couple of weeks ago and he has that great British accent. He says, little bits and pieces and little knobs and noggins and it's just brilliant. Tuna salad. Okay. All right, so let's, let's add this, this. And you can use this tuna trick um, for even like tuna casserole. So if that's something you made and um, you crave that flavor as you take chickpeas, you kind of mash them up and mix it with all your tuna casserole things, some noodles and a sauce and, oh my gosh. So satisfying and hearty. All right, let's take this here so you guys can see it. I didn't add any salt and pepper, but I probably should do that. I'm going to guess too, this is another kind of like, you can make a batch of this. Oh my gosh. So and I good. keep it? Yeah. And it gets better. It gets better. The next day, it's going to be great. Day three, it is like mind blowing good because all the flavors kind of marry together. Um, the celery still has its crunch, but it gets a little softer. The olives and the capers become best friends. <laughs> And it's very much a pantry recipe. So the only fresh stuff I used was celery and I put in some tomato, but everything else you can have on hand and make a batch of this and then make a batch another week and um, just keep all the ingredients on hand. It's really convenient. This is what I'm gonna be eating. And I like to eat, you can eat this in lettuce cups or you can eat it on some toasted whole grain bread or like a, um, a sprouted English muffin. Um, you can even make tuna salad tacos if you really want to and get fusion -y on it. Um, but this is, this is good. I'm going to, wow. That looks delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Come on. <laughs> Have a moment. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to tie it back to you. This is really Okay. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> that, that looked like another delicious creation from chef. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint and I'm gonna pick up where I left off. A little explanation about 
whole food, plant-based diets, and how they support our immune function. All right, so we've discussed the essential nutrients that whole food plant-based diets can give us, but how else do they support our immune system? Well, they have this capacity to work like antioxidants as well as having anti-inflammatory properties. So let's start first with antioxidants. So antioxidants, I'm gonna give you a quick overview. What, when we eat antioxidants, they essentially are compounds that are found in food that counteract the nasty behavior of some unstable molecules. So this is a super simplistic graphic that demonstrates what's happening here. So that mean little red monster in the middle, that's a free radical. He's very unstable and he's trying to create some havoc in, in our body. So what he's doing is he's stealing what are called electrons from healthy cells and that renders that healthy cell damaged. Right, And this could potentially lead to chronic diseases, including cancer. Now, when we eat antioxidants, that's the little green guy on the left. Well, antioxidants are very generous. So what they do is they will happily donate one of their electrons to this free radical so that it doesn't have to go around damaging our healthy cells. Now, the thing is, is that um, antioxidants, or I, I should say pro-oxidants, which are free radicals, these red monsters, they're pervasive. They're all around us, they're in our daily life. So it requires us to then eat a pretty healthy diet in order to give us a good amount of these antioxidants and counteract their negative effects. So where do we find antioxidants in food? Well, some of the best sources are citrus, our green leafy vegetables, are berries, right? That's why we hear so much good stuff about berries. They're super high in antioxidants. And then lastly, something to stay tuned for, there's other antioxidants in things like cocoa and cocoa nibs are what you see on the screen there. So antioxidant nutrients, I'm just gonna highlight specifically a handful of them and one of the best sources in our diet, vitamin C. So Chef Katie showed how she was hoping to use a red bell pepper in that first recipe, made a great substitution. But red bell peppers are surprisingly very high in vitamin C. Vitamin E is found in almonds. So if you had almonds or almond butter to use as a dressing or a sauce, really high in a great antioxidant called vitamin E. Then we have another mineral that is also an antioxidant. It's called selenium and two Brazil nuts give us like over 100% of the amount of selenium we need in a day. It's pretty impressive. And then we have some non-nutrients. So these are phytochemicals, carotenoids, as well as flavonoids. So carotenoids, you probably have heard of, beta carotene, that's a type of a carotenoid. And carotenoids are this big family of different phytochemicals. So we find carotenoids in orange, yellow, some dark, red and some dark green fruits and vegetables. So sweet potatoes are a great example of a food that's high in a carotenoid. And then flavonoids, that's another big group of phytochemicals. And berries, as I mentioned on the last slide, they're very high in, a, in many different types of flavonoids. So next I wanna talk about the third way that whole food plant-based diets are helpful for our immune system and that's through their anti-inflammatory mechanisms. So our immune system, how it works basically is that if there's a foreign invader, it, it fires itself up, right? So it's almost like it's go, gotta go do a job and it punches the clock. It says, all right, I'm here, I gotta do my job. Well, this is a normal good thing to be fired up, right? And what happens is there's a little bit of an inflammatory response that happens. This is acceptable, this is normal, it's only temporary and it's only done intermittently. But what can happen is that sometimes if we live a certain lifestyle, we might cause this immune system to constantly be firing. So instead of punching in, doing the job and then punching out, it never punches out. So the immune system is like constantly firing, constantly firing. And that's what inflammation is essentially. And so our lifestyle can lead to in certain things in our diet, a lack of activity, this can lead to 
excess inflammation. And over a long period of time, this is detrimental. It's detrimental not only to our immune system, but also has been shown to put us at increased risk for some chronic diseases, including cancers. So what foods then can we eat that are anti-inflammatory? Well, the first that comes to mind is one of the healthiest, healthiest fats in our diet, and that's from the olive. And olive oil as well has been shown to be anti-inflammatory. Next up are nuts and seeds and butter versions of the nuts and seeds. These are all high in compounds that have been shown to be anti-inflammatory. Also another appearance from our green leafy vegetables, as well as our berries. If you're noticing, we see some of these foods come up on this list. And this is why some of these foods are really dynamos in terms of the nutrition that they offer, but specifically for our immune support. So anti-inflammatory nutrients, I just wanna review a couple of them. So, Guess what? Beyond what a couple of them are, the best way to pursue an anti-inflammatory environment in the body has been shown through consuming a plant-based diet. Exactly what we're talking about tonight. Also some other herbs and spices. So every single herb and every single spice we can possibly use in our diet has anti-inflammatory properties, even black pepper. Olives and olive oil, I mentioned as well as some phytochemicals. So there's a special phytochemical called quercetin. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that. It's very high in apples and onions, and it's a phytochemical that has anti-inflammatory properties. But again, I've included a picture on this slide on purpose, and these are capers, right? Does everyone see them? So these are unripened, right? Young, fresh capers and they are very high in quercetin, surprisingly high. So you see where we can get real great flavor from something like capers, which is just sitting in our pantry, sitting in the fridge. But now we have this bang for buck phytochemical that has anti-inflammatory properties. So you can see how some of these foods really make a difference in a plant-based diet. All right, guess what time it is? <laughs> Ten. I, I'm so excited for this one. I can't wait. All right, so our last recipe, Chef Katie. Yeah. You're on. Do some banana juggling. Oh my God. I just feel so amazing. And now I know why it's because I ate capers. Oh my gosh, this is blow my mind. Okay. Um, dessert. We all love it. I mean, who doesn't love dessert? We all love dessert, but it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to take hours. Fruit is one of my favorite desserts because it's so simple and easy and healthy for you. Um, but it doesn't have to be boring, like just eating a banana. Sure, it's fine on a Monday night, but hey, it's Thursday. So let's have a little more fun with that. So I've got two beautiful bananas here. Make you smile. I'm gonna leave the skin on and cut it long ways from top to bottom. I got my own little like banana boats. And placing these on a baking sheet, what we're gonna do with these bananas is broil them. And your broiler setting on your oven is probably like your potato setting on your microwave. It's probably there and you never knew it existed. <laughs> but we all know how to grill, right? So grilling is when you have a flame underneath your food. Well, a broil is just a grill turned upside down your flame is on top. So that's the only difference, but it has the same effect as far as getting like charred, delicious flavor, especially when it's snowy outside. So let's face these bananas out. I got my broiler setting turned on and I'm gonna set these on the rack that's the highest up because I want it to be high up and close to that broiler. most beautiful thing about broiling is it doesn't take long. So I'm going to set that for about, mm, we'll say five minutes, but my nose will tell me when we're getting close. So I want to smell, it's kind of like when you throw like pineapple on the grill, you'll start to smell that caramelization happening. That's kind of what I'm paying attention to with this. Now, when those bananas come out, we're going to throw some antioxidants on them. You know, that sounds totally lame. We're not going to throw antioxidants on them. <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> yeah, like, yes. Where do I buy them? Where do I get them? <laughs> um, 
No, we're gonna throw cocoa nibs on there and some cinnamon. So Lori was talking about antioxidants in our spices and antioxidants and things like cocoa nib, which is awesome. Now, if you've never had a cocoa nib, treat yourself. When you're out making that like sumo orange run tonight, pick up a bag of cocoa nibs. <laughs> um, what cocoa nibs are, hopefully you can see this. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, they're just cocoa pods that they crush up. So I always compare, if you've never seen a whole cocoa pod or like never like went to a cocoa farm, like um, think about coffee because a lot of us understand coffee beans and then coffee is ground up or crushed out. Um, and coffee is kind of bitter. It has like that deep earthiness, um, but it's kind of bitter and they roast it and that gives it deeper flavor. Cocoa nibs are the same way. So you start with the cocoa pod, you crush it up. And this is kind of like when you do like a, a rough grind on your coffee beans, you get these like crunchy little things. Um, and then when they make chocolate, they like really grind it up and mix it usually with like some sort of fat and sugar and that kind of thing. The cocoa nibs are only the, the cocoa. So they are the chocolate flavor without the sweetness and without the other added stuff. Um, they also have a great crunchy texture. So they make a great little topping. If you're trying to, um, if you love chocolate, if you're like me and you like want that chocolate flavor, but you don't always want to add chocolate to everything, um, you can swap out like chocolate chips um, with cocoa nibs and that'll give you that same chocolatey thing. So like topping your bananas with a little bit of cocoa nibs is great. I make banana nice cream and I like to put cocoa nibs in there. I make strawberry nice cream and I put cocoa nibs on that. Um, they're great. So I'll stop selling cocoa nibs now. <laughs> it's only been four minutes, three minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you and then I'm gonna rotate. So you can see a little bit whew, of this guy starting to turn brown. I'm gonna rotate this because I want everybody to get that brown. And what is happening? Why are my bananas turning brown? What is going on? That is caramelization. Or if you're from Kentucky, that is caramelization. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the natural sugars in your food that are caramelizing. It's bringing out the natural sugars in your food. Um, Sometimes we think of like making a caramel sauce or we caramelize like sugar and butter. Same idea, but this is doing it the more natural way. So when you think about throwing a pineapple on the grill and you get those grill marks, that is caramelization. That is natural sugars. And you didn't have to add brown sugar. You didn't have to add sugar to it. You just get it naturally from the fruit, from the heat plus the sweetness. That's what gives you caramelization. So. Again, a healthy, delicious way to add more flavors. I'm, we're doing banana tonight, but again, you could do pineapple. You can even broil apples and pears, and it's like mind-blowing and delicious. All right, let me check it again. It's been two more minutes. Come here. Oh, He's excited. This is good. <laughs> I really wish you could be here and smell this. Most people that I know um, intimately, I will tell them I'm a monkey because I love bananas so much. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just gonna plate these up. You can see all the caramelization that's happening. I like to keep it in the, in the um, skin because then you have your own little like compostable serviceware, right? <laughs> and then as soon as these come out, we're gonna dash them with a little bit of cinnamon. A little, a little well tap. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. <laughs> Again, just like we did with the cumin and we and that heat activated the cumin and those tacos, the heat that's still on the bananas is going to activate the cinnamon. So you want to do that as soon as they come out of the oven. And then you get to get all chefy with your cocoa nibs. <laughs> oh my gosh. I do a lot of private parties. In normal times, I do a lot of private parties. And like if I bring cocoa nibs and put them on a dessert, suddenly people are like, oh my gosh, wow. It's impressive. I mean... <laughs> All I did was open a bag and like sprinkle and things. So, um, but yeah, that's that's dessert. And how easy was that? Well, that. Yes. 
Let's scoop out a little. Try not to burn my mouth off. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like a marshmallow. Like it's like a banana marshmallow. If you, oh my God. Yeah, I would love that. It just makes me happy. Yeah. Makes me happy to do the <laughs> So yeah, okay. I'm gonna go have another private moment. Damn <laughs> <Okay, I'm> it! <laughs> <Just hanging out. laughs> Thank you again, Chef. That one looks like a keeper. Like, yeah, I need to make that now, right? <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna share my screen again, and we're gonna wrap up the PowerPoint. So I'm just gonna pick up where I left off, and that is on our fourth and final way to support our immune system through whole food plant-based diets. So that is my favorite, the gut microbiota. Okay, so a little bit more about the gut microbiota. Here's the deal. What we want living in our gastrointestinal tract is the right type of balance of microbes that are benefiting us, right? So there's a whole jumble like trillions upon trillions of different microbes that exist within our GI tract. We want a beneficial balance because as it turns out, that is very important for our immune function. In fact, the estimates are up to 70% of our immune function is dependent upon what's happening in our gut, all right? So here's how I like to describe what we're eating and the gut microbiota in this nice little cartoon. Okay, so at the table on the right, you see some beneficial microbes. This is a nice little dinner party we have here, right? Lots of happy folks. They're enjoying their meal. They're having a good time. They are thriving. These are the beneficial microbes that we want in our gut. They're gonna benefit our immune function. And notice what they're eating. They're enjoying whole food, plant-based choices, right? Our nuts, our grains, fruits and veggies, legumes and seeds, they are feasting on those foods and it's making them very happy. Now this poor guy on the, on the left of them, right? He's sitting by himself. He doesn't look very happy. Um, he actually looks like he's up to no good. <laughs> he's sort of the bad bacteria, right? Or the bad microbes that are residing in our gut. And take a peek at what he's consuming. All right, it looks like it's a pepperoni pizza, I would say. And while pizza is not necessarily a bad choice, it's not what the beneficial microbes prefer to eat, okay? They prefer to eat all of these plant-based choices. So specifically, I wanna highlight some of those foods that have been shown to selectively find their way to our beneficial microbiota, and they are in chomping away at them and really benefiting our systemic health, but specifically immune function. So I'm gonna start first with asparagus, high in prebiotics. That's a special fiber that feeds our gut microbes. Bananas, what do you know? I wonder, wait, so not only delicious in the way the chef just showed us, but this beneficial, gut-friendly, immune-supportive ingredient. Yum, thank you very much. <laughs> also, we see onions. So chef used an onion earlier, but the whole onion family is also high in prebiotic special fibers. So, you know, I think of onions and the whole allium family as aromatics. Yeah, they impart flavor, they're tasty. I always forget how beneficial they are for our gut. And then also some sea vegetables. So I just happened to put on here some roasted seaweed. It's kind of trendy and popular right now but all seaweed vegetables also have, um, seaweed and other sea vegetables have beneficial, um, they're called polysaccharides that again, go right to our little friendly microbes living in our gut and make them happy because they, feed, they feast on them. Okay, so uh, supporting the gut. What we know about some of our food choices that will also benefit just the beneficial microbes are fermented foods. So think about kimchi or fresh sauerkraut they will give us additional beneficial uh, microbes. Some of our dairy that's fermented also will give us some of those, what we call probiotics, the beneficial microbes. 
but also some dairy alternatives have been fermented. So just check your labels. You might be able to find some that have been cultured with probiotics. Now I've talked about those prebiotics. So those are special fibers in things like a banana that are selectively feeding the beneficial microbiota. But with all of those specific food choices, really at the end of the day, what the research is showing is that a plant-based diet, especially one that incorporates mostly whole foods, this is the best way to support the beneficial microbes that live in our gut. And this has implications again for immune support. So just a couple slides about how now, like what's next? What can you do now to make this transition easier for yourself? I would first just suggest that you make gradual changes that make sense for you, right? Don't feel pressure to just like zero to 60, make all of these big dramatic changes to what you're eating. You can make subtle changes and over time, they're gonna be significant for you. So you pick and choose what you wanna do. Um, I think one of the easiest ways to transition towards a whole food plant-based diet is to think about processed foods and how to unprocess your diet in a way. Right, so even on this image here, take a look at the foods on the right, all these packages, right? <laughs> really not food, technically. They're kind of like remnants of what might have been food at one point. Uh, but you can replace them with whole food plant choices that are, especially if they're seasonal and fresh, delicious, but you can rely on some old staples like the banana and the potato to learn how to create some really delicious, easy meals for yourself. Um, and also it's, here's some specific ideas for adding plant foods to your diet. So could you start your whole, your day with a bowl of whole grains like oats? You can go sweet, top it with some berries, maybe some sumo orange slices, top it with something savory like olives and spinach. Why not mix it up, right? You could take one of the recipes that is currently meat-based, like a burger or like a chili or some other meat-based stew and convert it into a whole food plant-based choice. I bet you Chef Katie has a lot of examples. The two nose salad is a good example. And then there's a wonderful campaign called Meatless Monday. I almost always point this out to anyone I'm working with because it's, it's just a totally great resource for tons of recipes. And it's a great campaign just suggesting that maybe one night a week, try a vegetarian meal, you know, and then you could gradually add two nights a week. And before you know it, you'll be eating mostly plant-based. So here are some of my favorite resources. And again, we're gonna share this PowerPoint with everyone in the audience, but these are the ones I go to uh, for quality, trustworthy information about diet, nutrition, and cancer. And if you are as big a fan of Katie as the Cancer Wellness Center is, please take a look at her websites. She has two here and she can talk a little bit more about them. And she's also on social media. So if that's your thing, if you'd like to see more inspiration, uh, follow her on Instagram and on Facebook. And you know, she, I know she's very active on there and I get inspired by some of her, uh, what she shares. Okay, so thank you all everyone for attending. We do have time for questions. So um, I'm gonna stop my screen share and just see if anyone has anything to comment.